Great. So welcome, everyone. Um, as I stated, my name is Caitlin Duffy. Um, I work here with NCRP. NCRP is a research and advocacy organization founded to amplify the nonprofit voice in conversations about how philanthropy works. We advocate for philanthropy that benefits underserved communities and advances systems change. Um, just last, at the end of last year, we celebrated our 40th anniversary and published our new 10-year strategic framework, which includes the goal to intentionally connect to and move resources to movements that are important drivers of social and systems change. So we're very excited to bring today's conversation to our audience and all of you as part of this goal. So before I review logistics and today's agenda, I want to invite Lorraine Ramirez of Neighborhood Funders Group to join me in welcoming you. Lorraine? Hi, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much, Caitlin, for all of your work and for NCRP for not just being a co-host, but really carrying the weight on bringing this together. Um, so my name is Lorraine Ramirez, and I'm the Senior Program Manager for the Funders for Justice Initiative at Neighborhood Funders Group. Neighborhood Funders Group organizes funders around a number of issues, but really to ultimately to build resources for community-based power building and to organize, in particular, philanthropy to uh, resource movements. Um, uh, funders for Justice is a funder organizing platform uh, around racial and gender justice, and uh, specifically racial and gender justice organizing to end criminalization and state violence against communities, communities of color. Uh, so once again, thank you so much to Caitlin and NCRP, and thank you to all of our, uh, all of our speakers today and to our moderator, Molly. Thank you so much, Lorraine, and thank you again to Neighborhood Funders Group for co-hosting this very timely and important conversation with us. So for today's webinar, there's two features that you should be aware of in the WebEx software. Um, if you haven't noted already in the top right, um, you'll see a little blue box for the chat feature, um, and there should also be a little blue box for our Q&A. Um, there you can direct questions to um, myself as your host and to our presenters. Um, there will also be three polls today, which will show in the bottom right of your screen. Um, and let's get started with. Social media, please join us in this conversation. We're very excited to tap the collective wisdom, not only of our speakers, but all of you that are joining us. Um, you can tweet at NCRP and also NFG um, underscore org, and you please use the hashtag fund um, movements so that we can track the conversation. Today's agenda, uh, we will get started um, with our moderator, Molly, who I will introduce shortly, who will give some context for today's conversation. Um, we'll have two attendee polls to get a sense of who's joining us. Then we'll introduce our speakers and go through a moderated discussion, um, ending with a short answer poll, a Q&A with all of you, and closing thoughts from our speakers. So with that, I will turn over to Molly. Um, Molly Schultz-Hefseed is Assistant Director of the Unitarian Universalist Beach Program at Shelter Rock, where she is responsible for the democratic participation, civil and constitutional rights, and community organizing program areas. Molly is also a very valued member of the NCRP Board of Directors, a past co-chair of NFG, and the current co-chair of Funders for Justice um, NFG Initiative. So Molly, I leave it to you. Thank you, Caitlin and Lorraine, NCRP and NFT for organizing this call. Thank you to our speakers for all of their prep work and for their comments. And of course, to Mike Ticker, the number keeps going up, the 183 that are on the call right now, um, and, and, and the rest may, may continue to join us. So I think we're going to start by just finding out a little bit about who's on this call. So, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a type of organization, and if that's you, Go ahead and raise your hand, and, and we'll uh, get a sense of who's out there. So um, our, if you are a private or independent foundation, please use the little icon to raise your hand. Oh, actually, it's, out, it's there as a question. So you can just click on the box in the chat that says which, um, which uh, entity best describes what you are, a private independent foundation, a family foundation, corporate foundation, community foundation, public charity, nonprofit, or other. So please take just a couple of 
seconds and click the one that describes you best. There's just a couple of seconds left for any last folks that want to get a, an answer in. Okay, so um, now the next question is, uh, which region or regions of the country does your organization serve? So, uh, Caitlin, if you can go ahead and put up that question. Hi everyone, it's Caitlin. I'm going to go ahead and relaunch that poll, that poll so you have a few um, more seconds to answer that. So um, while Caitlin relaunches the poll, I think I'm just going to go ahead and tell you a little bit about who's going to be speaking on this call um, while you go ahead and hopefully uh, record your answer. And then we'll, we'll ask Caitlin to give us the highlights from both of the, um, the answers. Uh, but today, uh, today's call is about how to creatively fund social movements. And our speakers on the call will include Shalini Edens, the Director of Programs for the Urgent Action Fund. Uh, Sen Marie Sandaragan, Founder and Executive Director of Equity Labs. Di uh, Dia Bui, Co-Director of the Washington Peace Center. And Kelly King Jackson, Senior Program Officer with the Simmons Foundation. And um, Caitlin, is there any news from our poll? Is there anything you can share about the spread of people who are represented on the call? We're up to 204 participants. It looks like, uh, at least regionally, the vast majority of folks are uh, either Northeast or national. We've got about 20% of people on the call that are international. Um, and then just a, a few folks in the Southeast and the Southwest. Um, so I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a nice mix of folks. I'm not sure, Caitlin, if you have the ability to go back to what types of institutions are on the call. Um, but if not, then we can maybe follow up at the end and let folks know who's been on here. So um, before turning it over to our speakers, I want to offer just a few framing comments, and then we'll jump into the rest of the content. Um, yesterday, Charles Blow's op-ed in uh, op-ed, The Power of Disruption in the New York Times, talked about the importance of disruption and offered a succinct overview of how and why disruption works. He says, when Frederick Douglass attacked Abraham Lincoln by saying, he seems to possess an ever-increasing passion for making himself appear silly and ridiculous, if nothing worse. Douglas was being disruptive. When women suffragettes paraded through Washington, they were being disruptive. When Rosa Parks refused to surrender her seat, she was being disruptive. When civil rights activists marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, they were being disruptive. When LGBT people fought back at the Stonewall Inn, they were being disruptive. When ACT UP flooded Times Square, they were being disruptive. When Occupy Wall Street refused to move from their parks, they were being disruptive. When Black Lives Matter took to the streets and ground traffic to a halt, they were being disruptive. When Native Americans stood in resistance at Standing Rock, they were being disruptive. When Elizabeth Warren persisted, she was being disruptive. 
Disruption is not a dirty word. In this environment, it's a badge of honor. I couldn't agree with Charles Lowe more, and I want to offer a few footnotes to his wonderful op-ed. Disruption isn't spontaneous, and it isn't a goal. Disruption is a tactic of organized resistance. Organized resistance is a strategy of social movements, and social movements are the irrepressible public expression of human dignity and love. A few examples of both the scale of the threat we face and our capacity to respond, our collective capacity to respond just from the last 26 days of the new administration include last week when federal immigration officials arrested more than 600 people across 11 states in both anticipation and of increased enforcement and in response to the raids, United We Dream launches the hashtag Here to Stay Network to fight for immigrants at risk of deportation. When ICE agents show up to raid immigrants' homes and workplaces, Here to Stay gives people a chance to show up and disrupt. As of this morning, almost 25,000 people have signed up. The courts, uh, after rejecting President Trump's uh, Muslim ban, um, the courts are, it'll still be litigated, but as of now, uh, the ruling means refugees and travelers from seven predominantly Muslim nations can continue to enter the United States. This happens after tens of thousands of people protest at airports around the country. The swift and critical work of legal advocates is only one part of the story. Grassroots groups around the country put out the call to action over social media and email, and people showed up. It started in New York and spread to over 30 airports around the country. Fox News, of course, is already calling on town. Several towns and cities and counties around the nation are quote unquote caving to President Trump's threat to pull funding and abandon their sanctuary pledges to shield undocumented immigrants from federal authorities. But this is not what we're seeing. The sanctuary movement is growing and getting stronger every day. Local leaders and organizations are pushing for municipalities to protect immigrants, but they're also expanding the concept of sanctuary to protect communities of color from police violence. Around the country, organizations working on police accountability and violence are partnering with immigrant rights organizations to advance and expand the sanctuary movement. And as the Justice Department is taking a step back from efforts to protect transgender people under existing law, the department withdrew the Obama-era request to limit an injunction which would have halted enforcement of existing civil rights laws that provide protections for transgender people. The move suggests the federal government position on the pending legal questions surrounding transgender people's rights could be changing soon. But groups around the country like the Silvio Rivera Law Project, the Transgender Law Center, the Solutions Not Punishment Coalition, Breakout, Southerners on New Ground, Mahente and others are working closely to educate the communities about their rights and organize protection for their trans community as well as continue to put pressure on local, state, and federal agencies to preserve hard-won basic legal protections. And as the Trump administration approved moving forward on the Dakota Access Pipeline, the Deputy Secretary of the Army will be granting the final permit needed for completion, clearing the bureaucratic hurdle that was standing in the way of massive, of this massive project. But just as that's happening, Army veterans return to Standing Rock to form a human shield against police. A growing group of military veterans are willing to put their bodies between Native American activists and the police trying to remove them. These snippets don't even begin to capture the scale of the threats we face as a country, but also the determination, love, and resilience of those committed to fighting for justice. This is a movement moment, and there is an uncontainable level of interest, momentum, and direct engagement in the political life of our country. Our grantees around the country are seeing membership meetings with overflowing crowds. Community organizing groups are experimenting with new strategies to capture local energy and enthusiasm and harness it for the long-term struggle for justice. Some of the work out there might be hard for some of us in philanthropy to follow, but much of it can be seen, heard, and supported by philanthropic organizations. Today's call is to help us think about strategies we can use to respond to this movement moment in new ways. We've asked all of our speakers to start, their, start with their thoughts on the following questions. What is your organization experiencing in this new political moment, and how are you responding? Why is it important for funders to consider alternative, creative ways to move more resources to the groups driving social movements? Our first speaker 
today to offer some thoughts on this question is Shalini Edens, the, the Director of Programs for the Urgent Act and Action Fund. The Urgent Action Fund is a global women's fund that protects, strengthens, and sustains women and transgender human rights defenders at critical moments. Shalini's passion for women's health and rights is grounded in her deep belief for justice and equity. Her African-American and Indian heritage, strong sense of community and family are a compass to how she approaches her work. She has an extensive background in women's health and rights, with over 15 years of leadership experience in grassroots public health sector, providing direct services, training, education, and advocacy for women living and affected by HIV AIDS. Previously, Shalini served as the program officer for the UN Foundation in Washington, D.C., where she oversaw a portfolio focusing on advocacy and reproductive health. Shalini has experience in training and capacity building, building, program monitoring and evaluation, and curriculum design. She has worked with women's organizations globally in India, South Africa, and Mozambique to provide technical assistance to women-centered HIV AIDS programming, and she holds a bachelor's in sociology with a minor in African American studies from the University of California, Davis, and an MPH from the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. Shalini, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Molly, and uh, thank you to NCERP and NFG Funders for Justice for hosting the call. And welcome to all of you who are calling from all over the world and the country to join us. And I just want to say thank you also to my fellow presenters on the call. Um, I'm very happy to be a part of this important conversation at a very critical moment in our country. Um, so Urban Action Fund was established 20 years ago to respond to the exact kind of political environment that we're seeing in this country right now. And our response was really around providing flexible, rapid response grants that respond to the needs to movements and frontline activists. So our grants provide critical resources to women and transgender frontline activists at unexpected moments when there is a safety or security threat or there's an unanticipated advocacy opportunity. So since the election and the results of the election last year, we've seen an increase of safety and security requests from U.S.-based activists, um, specifically around requests for security cameras or to develop digital security plans. We've seen more requests coming from newly emerged locally-based coalitions and networks that do not have a 501c3 status but are responding to what they're seeing in their local community. Um, we have launched, immediately after the election, we launched a Resist and Reclaim emergency fund that is specifically responding to needs of U.S.-based act activists. This is very similar and almost the same focus of our rapid response grants that go to our, our grantees outside of the U.S., but we're really trying to establish it to really be reflective to the needs of the U.S. Um, we've also, since this, this new political environment that we're seeing ourselves in, have really looked at and continue to co-fund with other donors here in the United States because we feel that it's important to share the cost, but also to lessen the burden on organizations when applying and reporting out. Um, and so we found that that's been a very good use of our time and also a good use of building uh, networks and relationships with our peer donors. And finally, the other thing that we've been experiencing is just an, an increased level of engagement from our own individual donors um, who've reached out in multiple ways to support our work, but also to find out ways that they can be supportive and be more engaged in their own communities. Molly, did you want me to go ahead and answer the next question? Yes, that would be great, please. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so, as Molly described in the beginning of the conversation, we're really in a very unprecedented and unpredictable political moment. So I think as funders, it's really important that we reflect that kind of um, a moment that we're in through the kinds of approaches that we have in our, in our funding. We really need to be having more robust and frequent conversations about truly being at risk, being and bold with the way that we do our, our funding. 
We have to support moment, movements to be nimble in their strategies while also being reactive and preventative. And I think I, I also want to just say out loud that as funders, it's important for us to really name what's happening in this country right now. The very fabric of justice is being destroyed, and the tone of this current administration is around misogyny, white supremacy, and capitalism. And as funders, we have to name that. We cannot leave that only up to movements to be naming. Our very universal human rights of freedom of speech and assembly are being threatened, and it's important for us to really think about how activism is starting to be criminalized in this country. There's an increase of less tolerance for civic dialogue and dissent, and there's going to probably be more stigma against activists who will undoubtedly face risks and vulnerabilities. So we as funders really need to be thinking about how we can support activists to be, remain resilient and remain engaged in the work that they're doing. And I'll end there. Okay, thank you so much, Celine. Um, our next speaker to, to start with this set of questions about what you're experiencing in the new political moment and what it's important for funders to consider is Sen Marie Sandaragan. Uh, Sen Marie is the founder and executive director of Equity Labs, a South Asian American human rights startup working at the intersection of story, art, and security. Also known as the Elite Diva, um, Sen Marie is a transmedia storyteller, technologist, and journalist who believes story is the most important unit of social change. Her work has been recognized by the Producers Guild of America, uh, Diversity Program, the Museum of Contemporary Art, the Annenberg Innovation Center, Slam Dance, MIT Center for New Media Studies, the Sorbonne, Source Magazine, Utney Reader, the National Center for the Humanities, the National Science Foundation, the Indian Film Festival of Los Angeles, and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Thank you, um, Ben Marie, if you, um, if you want to go ahead uh, and uh, share your thoughts on the first two questions, that would be great. Sure. So welcome, everybody. And I just wanted to um, make a quick correction. We're actually equality labs, not equity labs. So for folks that are so taking sorry. notes or trying to Hi. find No, <laughs> not a problem. <laughs> So I, not a problem. So just to give a sense of what we've seen on the ground, I think what's interesting is that with Equality Labs, we are a South Asian um, cultural and technology project that is one of the only groups that have women, gender nonconforming, trans folks that do digital security. So I think one of the things and part of the advantage of what I'll be bringing to our conversation today um, is really what we've learned in having done um, 40 digital security rapid response trainings all around the country. And I think that that ability to have really worked with um, vulnerable groups within Muslim, Arab, South Asian communities from both rural and urban contests really gave us a sense of what is the kind of edge points around what we're seeing in um, movements today um, right after the Trump administration. And I think that, you know, in echoing a lot of Shalini's comments, I think that it is many of the activists that we're working with on the ground are really struggling with this change moment and having to deal with a volatile environment where things related to their membership, their funding, and even the legality of their work is shifting very rapidly. And so from a digital security perspective, a lot of what we're doing is beginning to help folks look at what do they present publicly about their work and what do they start to move underground so that they can continue to support their um, membership but don't risk their ability to work for the long term. And um, my sense with many funders right now is that, you know, we're so used to having so much of our content um, open and public because we want to, from a public relationships perspective, you know, laud our wins communicate our stories because that's how we communicate return on investments to our funders and our donors and our boards. But, you know, when we are in the kind of authoritarian administration that we have currently, being above board and connecting and displaying all of our strategies out in the open can actually jeopardize um, the, the membership and the goals of the institutions that we're working in. And I think that, that, that shift in perspective and frame is something that I think both funders and organi organizers are having a hard time, to de hard time dealing with. <clears throat> I think also the other thing that I've seen is that 
um, many organizations um, are really struggling with the fact that they may have committed to a certain set of parameters related to proposals they put in before the administration, but their needs are rapidly different. And so um, a program or a campaign that would have been expansive or would have had different kind of policy targets are just not going to happen under the Trump administration now. So more than ever, I think it's really important for funders to check in with their grantees and see um, what is going to shift with proposals that have already gone in or in process and how flexible can we be about um, naming what we see as structural change when uh, we know that policy venues and policy avenues may be more obstructed now more than ever um, given not only the Trump administration but also this Republican um, emboldened Congress. Um, I think the other thing that I also saw is that you know, we were, again, like in a very unique position providing digital security um, with both, in, both from an intersectional frame in which we had both um, gender diversity, but we also had a very strong process of um, naming surveillance not as simply a technology problem, but actually one of state violence and one that has a long historical legacy with the patrolling and controlling of um, women and people of color communities uh, in this country. And I think one of the things that I was struck by is that in our field, and I think many um, of the smaller nonprofits um, who are on this call can also identify with, is that I think that we're very good within um, the funder community and within the nonprofit sphere to advocate for intersectionality in our analysis but that doesn't necessarily go into the translation of who gets funded to implement intersectional solutions. And so I think now more than ever, we must not um, just simply fund big tentpole organizations that are run um, by white cis men, but we must also be very bold in terms of funding groups that might be rough around the edges, that might be in the middle of incorporation, but may not have all of the structural um, things that we've seen in place for bigger funding, but actually could be the only frontline groups that really be able to build leadership and build resilience in the communities that are targeted the most. So that could include women's associations out of mosques. Um, it could include um, religious institutions. It could be um, queer and LGBT trans collectives. Um, the point is, is that we must not only um, name intersectionality in our analysis, but we also have to fund it. And we really need to fund it um, in a way where we're not um, simply limiting ourselves to programmatic support, but looking really at operating support. Because my sense is, is that, that, you know, just even I can say within our ORNA organization, but also with some of our folks that we have been um, uh, supporting, is that um, the programmatic goals are shifting so quickly within this very volatile administration that um, program, program grants aren't really going to be able to address the needs of the shifting ground underneath these nonprofits. And that in many ways, if you guarantee the core operating um, through this administrative period, then we know that these institutions can hold the line through some of the most difficult periods of our lives. And some of the operating concerns many groups I know are concerned about is whether or not they'll be able to ensure um, staffing through the next four years. Um, they're concerned about volatile grant portfolios, and so will they have to start shrinking and making attrition measures now? I think also the question of the ACA is very, very um, on top of a lot of people's minds because many small to mid-range nonprofits rely on ACA to be able to cover insurance gaps for their staff. And so if the ACA is repealed, um, we'll have big um, uh, shifts to people's operating budgets. So I think that, you know, um, the ability for us to be able to think about creating a nimble funding ecosystem that can be and partnered with a very nimble funding movement system is, is part of a, a sea change of our understanding that we are not just institution building right now, but we are in fact movement building. And movement building means that we need to be able to move as one entity um, with a very kind of fast iterative feedback loop between funders and those that are kind of leading the work. Great. Thank you so much, Ben Marie. I really appreciate those comments. and. 
and I hope that they're going to um, get sort of uh, time to marinate a little bit in the, in the minds of everybody listening. Uh, we're going to open it up after our next two speakers for a little bit of a group conversation, and then we're going to ask you to weigh in uh, in the Q&A section. If you have questions throughout <laughs> for any of the individual speakers and you want to post them through the Q&A function, that would be great. Um, it will be good to have a few questions to be able to start the open conversation with. Um, our next speaker is um, Dia Bue. Um, Dia is a Vietnamese queer woman of color organizer, activist, and facilitator. She has more than 10 years of experience working on issues including immigrant rights, racial justice, access to higher education, women's rights, rights, health equity, LGBT equality, and economic justice. Currently, Dia serves as the co-director of the Washington Peace Center, an anti-racist, anti-war, and multi-issue strategic resource organization based in Washington, D.C. She is also the board co-chair of Many Languages, One Voice, and a National Advocacy Council member of the Queer and Documented Immigrant Project of United We Dream. Originally from Los Angeles, she moved to the D.C. metropolitan area six years ago to bridge her passion for community organizing with effective, social, uh, effective policy change. Her lifelong commitment to social justice is rooted in her own experiences growing up in a refugee family living in a low-income and immigrant neighborhood. In 2006, she graduated from the University of California, Los Angeles, with a degree in Sociology and Asian American Studies. Dia is also an artist, artist, creative producer, poet, and storyteller. She has performed in multiple cities across the country. She embraces culture, writing, and music as tools of learning and empowerment. Dia, um, if you could share your thoughts on those opening questions, that would be great. Uh, thank you so much. Peace and blessings to all. I'm really grateful to be a part of this uh, really critical conversation uh, with so many folks who have joined in, and hopefully those who could not be will be able to access uh, this conversation wherever they are. And I'm so glad that um, you know, both organizations who are hosting this are, are doing this. Uh, from myself in D.C. and as part of the Washington Peace Center, which I have often told folks that the Peace Center operates as a strategic hub for activist organizers and community members. The Peace Center has been around uh, since the 1960s, started out as an anti-war organization and then transformed and morphed into an anti-racist grassroots multi-issue organization uh, that works for community um, transformation and nonviolent social change. And over the years, what we've seen uh, so far is nothing like we've seen now. Um, for the Peace Center itself, uh, on a daily basis, I receive calls uh, from those who are looking to hold marches, rallies, and protests in the D.C. area uh, to respond to what's happening. Uh, the rapid executive orders um, to the cabinet appointees have set everyone in, in such a huge alarm that I think a lot of folks are have been in a way, operating in a panic mode and trying to funnel that energy in a strategic way. And so what I can share, in addition to what my fellow panelists have shared so far, so poignantly, is that there's urgency of now. Um, now being that the gap of how quickly we can turn around resources needs to be shortened and tighter, and those are the challenges that we presented with. Uh, we can't seem to respond quick enough to support local organizers and activists to respond, um, especially with the rapid ice raids that have happened in the last week with 600 people across the country being detained. And so we are fortunate that we have organizations who've been doing this groundwork for such a long time and created infrastructure in order for get us to get to a point like organizations like United We Dream, Mi Gente, and so forth. Um, some things that I want to share in terms of the additional question um, is around thinking about how we do a work that encompasses accessibility, sustainability, and flexibility. I think those are three really poignant words to really think about when we think about funding the work. Um, and our approach with the Washington Peace Center has really been how do we as an organization, as a hub, support community members in creating their own hubs and resources? Uh, so that's very important. So here's some overlining. Um, themes that I want to share with you all. It's really important to fund frontline communities. I think oftentimes funding does get channeled into advocates 
um, and then make it down to community members, and sometimes it gets lost in translation, and so it's very important to really meet folks where they're at. And so um, they may not have the structure in order to report back or have fiscal sponsorships. At uh, the Peace Center, we provide fiscal sponsorships, and we can't keep up with the amount of requests, and so it's been really challenging. Um, and so looking at ways in which fiscal sponsorship can live and however that structure can morph so that frontline and impacted communities are able to receive the funding that they need. And funding is really limited and stretched in a lot of different ways. And I think that one of the things that can be offered are other kinds of resources. You know, we talked about security earlier in this call. It's such a critical need at this point. I can't tell you how many activists and community members are really terrified for themselves about their own safety. And at this point, what we operate on is that everyone is arrestable at this point. And that's the mentality that folks have across DC and across the country that I've spoken to. So offering secure spaces to organize meetings is really critical at this moment. Uh, security training uh, are key. Um, for all the fundees and grantees, I think it's really important for them to also know their rights. Um, this is something that folks have tried to put on trainings, but we need to be able to disseminate this information as quickly and broadly as possible for folks to understand their, their rights. And not only that, it's been also challenging to connect legal networks and support um, the legality of organizations and how they're able to move about and actions and organizing have been really challenged. I would say for the Peace Center, we have been under attack by the right. Um, and we've been infiltrated in the past as well. And so this is uh, not just happening in DC, but across the country. And some key things that I want to add on as I've spoken to community members before this call is language access is key. There are a lot of community members who are multilingual, bilingual, and having translated materials, having interpreters is helpful in this process as we're building a movement and how do we think about funding spaces where there are community hubs, where a multiracial, multi-ethnic communities are able to access it and not just primarily English language speakers or um, folks who are educated and college educated. And that's something that has been a, a deep challenge in engaging impact to community members and make sure that they are centered and the voices on the front lines um, because they're struggling to just put food on the table or struggling to just not be arrested and detained. And so that's really important for us to figure out how do we support these impacted community members and make sure that their voices are centered while also maintaining their security and safety. The other of which is, okay. I think, yeah. of the, oh. Mm -hmm. We're just about at time. So if you can, okay. um, if you can wrap up the last piece, I'm sure there'll be time in the rest of the discussion to, yeah. to bring out some of the additional points. That'd be great. Yes, definitely. And so the last quick thing I want to share is just looking at uh, holistic health, arts, and culture resources. A lot of folks are um, succumb to mental health and closing and unfolding in on themselves, and it's really difficult for us to organize when folks are trying to maintain their own health. Great. Thank you so much, Dia. Um, and uh, our final speaker is uh, Kelly King Jackson. Kelly is the Senior Program Officer with the Simmons Foundation. She joined the foundation in 2012 after more than 15 years engaged in nonprofit advocacy work around issues such as access to health care, community engagement, and youth young adult leadership. Since joining the foundation, Kelly has worked extensively on youth, homelessness, and LGBTQ issues. In addition to her grant making work, Kelly serves on the steering committees for the Houston Continuum of Care and Away Home America. Kelly also serves on the Out in the South Fund Steering Committee, a pool fund focused on LGBTQ issues across the South. In addition to work with the grant, grant portfolio, Kelly is primarily responsible for the foundation's communications, including website, grant database, annual report, and social media engagement. Kelly is a graduate of NYU with a BA in sociology, and she's also an alumna of the Leadership Houston and the ABSI Connecting Leaders Fellowship Program. So Kelly, if you could offer us a few thoughts, that would be great. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a privilege to join you all today. Um, the Simmons Foundation, we're a small private foundation in the Houston area, and we fund about $3 million a year. Um, Two-thirds of our funding goes to operating support, and we're really committed to that. Um, and we also fund multi-year. And so we have already committed about a $1 million in our budget um, for 2017 that are multi-year grants. And that for us is really important um, given the times that we're currently experiencing. Um, <clears throat> I'll jump right in because I think that a lot of what I wanted to say folks have really 
talked about, so I'm really looking forward to some of the question time. Um, for us right now, it is critical that we are listening to our grantees. Um, we are actively and proactively reaching out to our grantees, asking them questions about pressing issues. Um, we're asking them about um, what they're hearing about possible changes in their funding on um, state and federal level. We're asking about changes um, that national funders have been making based on um, specifically the Affordable Care Act um, and um, some of our health care grantees and the work um, that they've been really invested in for the past five years and, and really feeling like things are at a still, um, at a stopping point and really feeling very uncertain. And um, what we're trying to do is, one, be responsive to that, but also to leverage our relationships with funders outside of the area to push conversations forward, um, to leverage additional dollars down into our community. Um, we are hearing from our grantees that um, they're tired, they're exhausted, um, there's anger, there's angst. Um, folks are trying to respond in um, very rapid, at a rapid pace on many different issues. Um, our foundation is values driven, uh, so we work very um, deeply on LGBTQ issues, um, on immigration um, with immigrants and refugees, um, again, uh, Affordable Care Act and some of the work around access to health care. Um, and so a lot of the issues that we've been working on for the past few years are issues that um, are so volatile right now and really so much uncertainty. And so our job in listening to our grantees is to figure out how can we be more outward facing. Um, our grantees know who we are. Um, they know the values that we have. Um, they know that we support uh, reproductive justice and we're investing dollars there. They know that we, we support um, our immigration work. But what we've d done this year is to be more intentional about being outward facing, um, talking to our colleagues who do not um, share the same values that we have and trying to get them to the table. Um, we have also been more outward facing because we know that there are other groups out there that would be great fits for our foundation and we're trying to be more proactive in that way. Um, we feel strongly that the work is urgent and as a sector, now is the time for us to show up. Um, we are really committed to trying to learn how to be flexible. Um, I will not lie and say that private philanthropy um, is doing that well. Um, and even in this time, um, I, I sense the frustration on a lot of program staff on how do we move quicker. Um, so the feedback from some of the previous speakers I think is really valuable for the sector. Um, we have had the opportunity at our foundation to do a lot of board education. And so we took our fourth quarter board meeting as an opportunity to educate our board on how our grantees and the issues that we work around will be impacted by the change in leadership in this country. Um, and so we were able to, for the first time in our history, get a pool of flexible dollars that we're able to then um, push out the door at a much more rapid pace. Um, it's the first, again, the first time we've ever done that before. Um, we also were able to this year to um, release our first quarter grant before our board meeting. Um, so we have multi-year grants in our health portfolio, and we felt very strongly that um, they needed those dollars now, and we were able to cut those checks in January instead of March. Um, and so for us, in our local context, that's really important because our legislature is, is meeting right now on the state level. And so for our local advocates, they needed those dollars to um, respond in a quicker pace. Um, the other thing that we're actually looking at is how do we do more community building and what is our role as a foundation in doing some of that work? Um, so we're looking at some community meal um, model where we're looking to partner with grantees um, to start, start some conversation and dialogue um, and build relationships in our community. And we're also looking at possibly doing um, some self-care and healing work. And we're, we've thrown around ideas about doing a yoga event um, or other ways um, to support holistically our grantees and the work um, that they're doing that is so very critical. Um, I think the last thing that I would say is that we believe that organizing and policy work are key. 
Direct service is obviously very important for, for meeting the, the day to day needs of our families and in our community. But um, if we don't have policy, uh, we will continue to churn programs. And, and we real, feel very strongly that advocacy and organizing are a good and smart investment. Um, it is the values of our, our leadership here, and so we're able to be very transparent about our investments. Um, we have made specific commitments to school discipline, again, immigration um, and um, work around our refugee populations here, uh, reproductive justice and homelessness. And so this year, we've been very intentional in, in talking to our grantees about their advocacy strategies and priorities and have made a commitment to elevate um, their priorities as we're talking in our advocacy conversations um, with our local leaders and our, and our federal leaders. Um, and we feel that it is our responsibility to make sure that we are aligning our messages um, with the organizations that we have been investing in. Great, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Kelly. I just I want to thank all four of our speakers. Um, I really heard some some clear suggestions out there that I just want to try to recap and then and then ask for one more round of very short comments and then we'll take a few questions from the call. I heard some of the advice out there about how to creatively fund social movements included really an encouragement to sort of get out there and talk to your grantees, um, probably in a different way than than some of us may be accustomed. Um, I've heard the, the encouragement to be flexible. So, um, you know, many groups across the board have submitted proposals to us that, that didn't anticipate this sort of cataclysmic political situation. And so thinking more, um, more directly about how to actually offer that flexibility instead of waiting for groups to ask it, and really just thinking about, um, you know, Beach has said this for years, but if there were ever a time to think about switching your grants to general support grants, this would be the time, right? It gives your groups maximum flexibility and it provides the greatest level of protection for your organization in terms of what's reported to you in the grants uh, from the foundation side. So I would really encourage colleagues to think about why a general support grant is helpful. And I heard uh, clearly this question about how transparent um, and, and out there are we about the kinds of work we're funding and really um, I think thinking very clearly about uh, how to move resources to the field and partner with our grantees to support their work and to do that with the greatest amount of flexibility and overall support. There was an encouragement to look at intersectionality and I, I want to offer a, I think a really easy way to connect with that as an idea from the grant maker perspective which is that a lot of times our grantees are ahead of us on this. They're, they're already intersectional in how they think about and do their work. And so one of the things we can do is ask them who else they're working with and, and what relationships are valuable and helpful to them, regardless of our issue area or silo, because a lot of times it's that ability to show up and support other communities that creates the relationships that really allow people to bring their whole self and their whole community to work. And we're so focused in our program areas that we, we find it harder to justify the grants that don't fit that clearly. And so maybe one way to think about intersectionality within the more limited framework of foundations is to really look at the ecosystem of organizations and how they're working together, even when it might be outside of your direct uh, program strategy. I heard a really clear encouragement to take risks um, and to just, you know, now more than ever, I don't think anybody knows what's actually going to work. And my guess is, going back to Charles Blow and his, um, his op-ed, that sometimes the more disruptive work might actually create the openings that allow us to really fight for uh, justice and fight for preserving um, and expanding uh, the rights that people, that people have. Um, and then, uh, Kelly, I, I really appreciate your encouragement to really think about how to be more community-minded and, and build community locally, particularly for local funders, but also where it's relevant for national funders who have place-based grant-making strategies to really look at what would, it, what would it mean to have a different kind of engagement and to, and to show up and to really be supportive and to encourage people in the foundation to be more engaged and involved in community as well as supporting community building efforts. So, um, so those are a couple of the things I pulled out of your, your different remarks. And I, I guess I would just ask one question and then I'm going to go to the chat and the Q&A to see what else is out there. But 
But I, I'm wondering if, if any of you can sort of offer up um, uh, any advice for funders who um, really, uh, really um, uh, want to think about funding organizations, for example, that might not be a C3 or might not be a C4 or, you know, might not fit their funding area. I think if, if we're talking about creativity, we really have to be thinking about actually the whole range of resources that our institutions may be able to bring to bear in support of social movements. So are there some additional ideas that, that you would offer uh, very briefly, um, shortly, um, strategies you've used or that you've seen from your experience that, um, that you think are creative that might have new appeal um, in this moment? So just a, a very uh, a quick round or whoever wants to jump in on that. And then we're going to go to the Q&A and see a couple of questions from the audience. Um, this is Ben Mori. Um, I'd like to <clears throat> start us off with that, um, particularly because I think <clears throat> for our organization, we were one of those groups. We started almost two and a half years ago um, dealing with some intense um, digital security attacks um, on our community from Hindu fascists and had to be very nimble in the way that we were um, mobilizing. But I think that some of our example could really be useful, I think, for funders in this moment. And I think when you're funding um, emerging groups, a couple of things I would advocate, particularly groups that are under attack, that are dealing with constituents that um, are vulnerable to the state, whether they're folks that are incarcerated or undocumented or what have you, I would say when you fund, not only fund boldly, but fund with an ecosystem of services. So because they're funding um, at, at a time when they're directly under attack, it may be all that they could to submit their proposal, but they need some additional org dev support to perhaps like institutionalize and think through what is going to be the best institutional model for them. Um, and to do so confidential, you know, confidentially, not in a proposal directly to you, but in uh, online conversation so that there isn't paper tracking what um, resilient strategies that they may do. Um, but also to look at ways that, you know, and I very much appreciate, Kelly, what you said, to be able to support them to do self-care. You know, so even if in addition to like a $5,000 grant, there was an additional $1,000 that was given to the course that really allowed them to decide what self-care meant for their organization, whether that was like hiring a trauma counselor, whether that was like making sure there was a masseuse or there's healthy food in the office or they could have bean bags or things for people to sleep because people are living at the office. But that ability to make sure that the work is funded, but also the long-term investment of the leadership is also supported is very valuable because oftentimes organizers are choosing between keeping the doors open or protecting a family versus their own long-term process. So I feel like, you know, thinking smartly about how to do that would be very useful. I think the other thing related to your question, which I really wanted to emphasize, um, is that as funders, we are also a point of vulnerability um, and a point of where groups can be attacked. And I think Black Lives Matter was an excellent forerunner where we saw certain foundations that were the fiscal sponsors for BLM groups were then finding themselves on Breitbart or Fox News or even, you know, more, more importantly than the, the, that institution, we can see Soros. We know that groups that are going to be um, movement building with organizations will also come under attack. And so I think that what we could do is be very smart and strategic about how we formulate our RFPs and our programs so we don't get into trouble. So I would say instead of making calls for how do you resist Trump, we talk about resilience and community building and strategies. And data cannot be subpoenaed if there's no data to track. So this is also part of the process of doing fun, um, you know, board education in terms of like how do you document your return on investments that we don't take so specific levels of um, uh, data about what our grantees work are, the numbers that they're doing, where they're gra gathering, because proposals and reports on proposals can be subpoenaed and can make vulnerable groups that are actually sharing intensive strategies to support vulnerable communities. So I think that it requires every foundation at this moment to have an internal conversation about their vulnerabilities and their data practices the ways that they communicate um, with their grantees and internal to their grantees, and also the level of education people have about 
what makes for a secure process. And, you know, I have to really do um, a shout out to Shalini and Urgent Action Fund because their nimbleness is also matched with understanding that those that are under risk, you know, at times may be applying anonymously or compartmentalized with their identity. And I think not very many funders know um, how to support that risk. And I think this is why um, digital security isn't a conversation of services that we provide for our grantees it's actually something that really needs to begin with us uh, um, in the funder realm, because I think in the funding space, um, we are a conduit for vulnerability that we need to look at um, differently. Thank you, that's, um, that's actually really, really helpful. And, um, and I think it sort of raises this set of questions, and, and I'm seeing some of the things throughout the chat that are coming up about like, well, beyond the limitations of C3, C4, like how do we, how do we think about using our assets as foundations? There's questions about um, how do you actually fund social movements, right? This sort of like, how do you fund new and emerging social movements, the groups that don't have a 501c3, et cetera. So I'm wondering, Shalini, if I can go ahead and call on you, if you have maybe one or two recommendations for beginner funders who really want to think about um, uh, this, this question about creatively, you know, my board will only approve grants to 501c3 groups, et cetera, that kind of funder. Um, can you say a few words of, of like, here's, here's where you can put your feet on the path of a conversation that might be able to move your institution to, to more flexibility. So could, could you offer one or two words of encouragement or, or observations about your own process? Sure. Um, thanks for the question. I think I think two things, one, um, well, two words, fiscal sponsorship. Um, I think that that is one very simple way um, to fund groups that don't have a 501c3 registration status. And for UAF, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, for UAF, we don't require groups to be registered as long as there's a fiscal sponsor so that there's a, an account where the funding can go. Um, and then I think the other thing is the supporting of intermediaries. So if it's, if it's impossible for an organization, for a foundation to fund through a fiscal sponsor, there are public foundations. And I think many of those public foundations have a way to fund um, that where there's not a requirement for a registration um, and can fund to non-registered groups. So I think that's another way. And then thirdly, I would just re-emphasize what I said earlier in my comments around this co-funding model. Um, I think there's a lot that we have learned in the last few months when we've done co-funding, and I think there's a lot of um, things that we can iron out in terms of making the process very simple for grantee partners, but I think it's a way for us as funders to just put down our egos, quite honestly, and come together on this and not expect um, those in the movement and activists to figure out where to go and how to fund. and how to fund their work. So I think shared funding is another way for us to look at how we can come together around supporting the movements and really being there for activists so that they're not having to do all of the admin work while they're also doing the frontline work. That's great. Can, That's I, Molly, can, I, add, can I add something really quickly? I wanted to say we also use, um, we'll approve grants that use a fiscal sponsor and one thing that I encourage, especially new organizations, meaning new to kind of grant making, um, is that they make sure that their interests are protected and have some sort of agreement, because we have seen some organizations that um, whoever was the fiscal sponsor, they didn't really kind of work through some of that. And so I think that providing that guidance to the smaller org groups is really, really important, and funders should have a responsibility to doing some of that education to support them through that process. Um, and so we do make recommendations to folks who come to us who don't have a fiscal sponsor. Here are some gr groups you can contact just to try to pave the way because a lot of the learning curve is so short um, and they often don't have the resources um, to do some of that, that work. So I think that that's really important. Um, and the other thing I was going to say is we are a part of some grants, some funder provider collaboratives. And so what we've been able to do is to put some dollars into the collaborative that then re-grants to partners that are at the table. And that's been really a, a good way for some of the smaller um, groups to, to kind of get their feet in the door and also to get introduced to other funders. Um, and it's been a powerful mechanism. But I will also say that as funders, we have had to really name the importance of um, intersectional work 
and the importance of m making intentional space for groups that are led by people of color, led by the LGBTQ community. Um, and that has to be a part of the conversation that we, we must be very intentional about that. Thank you so much, Kelly. So I, I, I'm going to jump in real quickly because uh, all my fellow panelists has really inspired me to bring up this point, which is that from folks on the ground that I've heard time and time again, it's if you don't know a funding officer, it is difficult for you to even get to the door or the table or someone to get on the phone with you to, to speak with you about your work and what you're doing. And it's happening a lot with folks on the ground who are just starting up. And it's like if you don't know funding officers, you can't get anywhere, even if you submitted an application. And so I think it's key, it may not be folks on this call, but shifting the culture among funders that to be more accessible and be open as much as possible uh, to folks who you may not have a relationship with, but really open those doors up because what it has been like for folks on the ground is if you don't know any officer, you can't get anywhere and any funding and support. Great. I'm glad you brought that up. I actually think that there's a, a sort of set of practices around being flexible and open and and, um, and trying to think about how to be uh, uh, thoughtful. I, I think one thing I would, I would throw out there too is that given that so few of our, our funding institutions can accurately have any sort of best guess about winning much, I mean, it depends on the state you're in and the issue area you're working on, but it would seem like given the enormity of the threats that many of the communities we care are up against, it's a really great opportunity to actually engage your board in a conversation about we're just, we're going to do things differently in the face of this. And I'm wondering, Kelly, if you could just say, a few more words. We got a couple of chat questions about sort of like what is intersectionality and, and what does that mean and where do we start and are there good resources? Um, and so I'm just wondering if you could say a few words about um, is, is that word widely understood in your institution and was there a set of conversations that helped you get there or um, is that how you describe the work? But then in, inside your institution, maybe you talk about it differently. I think there's probably a range of funders from people who totally know what that word means um, and their institutions 100% aligned with it, and then people who, you know, it's a, it's a newer concept and they would like to think about how that might relate to their funding work. Could you offer just a few thoughts on that? Sure. Um, we take time in each board meeting to do board education. Um, and what we've really been trying to be intentional about over the last two years is how do we weave together our portfolio for to demonstrate the intersectionality, right? So how does our health work connect to our youth work, connect to our civic engagement work that connects to our human services work? And that they're not separate because people are whole beings. Um, and so um, our board has begun to really understand that as we've given them real good examples through our grantee partners. Um, our collaborations have been really important and as we explain how we bring partners together and why in, in homelessness it's not just homelessness, it's about affordable housing, um, it's about LGBTQ rights and protections, and we can now do a better job of weaving that together. Um, and I can give you a very practical example of actually having to educate our board in January around um, families that are connected um, to a company related to us um, that may be Im impacted by um, the executive order that came down, right? And so the immediate response was, hey, no, that why would that affect us? And then we started talking about that families come with mixed status sometimes. And using that as an education opportunity for our board to say this is what mixed status means, this is um, why we need to be making sure we're getting information out, even as a foundation to employees, to partners. Um, and so that is one practical way. We took it away from the kind of theory to really give real examples. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, I also, there seem to be some, some questions, uh, some clarifying slash examples of this sort of question around pool funds, co-funding, uh, intermediaries, et cetera. And um, those of you on the call sort of each work through some of these different strategies. I'm wondering if somebody could talk about the difference between co-funding and a pool fund. And, um, and then also, that's, a, that's one question. The other one, anybody can weigh in, would be, uh, I think, Thea, you're, you were really, you're talking about accessibility of funders, right? And I think that's critical that that a, 
individual as well as an institutional level. And so aside from the encouragement to individuals to think about how to be more open, um, are there some ways in which institutions can, um, again, given the caution about how many of our cards we put on the table, uh, best practices that you guys have seen from some of the work that you've done and the work that you've participated in that was accessible to you? What does accessibility really mean? Um, between movement folks and, and funders. So um, there's two questions there. There's like a technical, what's the difference between co-funding and a pool fund? And then there's this other question out there about what, what are some of the actual things that make funders more accessible other than just picking up the phone um, or responding to an email? So I'm going to put those two questions out there and see if anybody wants to jump in. <laughs> Kelly, I, I can start. Um, so for us, uh, pooled funding is an example. We're partnered with another foundation. We put money into a joint account, if you will, um, for simple as to, uh, to be simple. And then um, members of our immigration collaborative are able to apply for that funds from that pool of dollars. Um, for us, our co-funding really looks like um, the same foundation saying, hey, we will fund the training for this organization, and us saying we will fund the, the staffing. Um, and so we're, work, we're both agreeing that we will fund the same initiative or organization, but we're coming in um, at different places in the work. Um, and a lot of that for us really has to do with the priorities of our foundation and what we're able to fund and sometimes the other foundation, if that answers that. Great. Thank you, Kelly. And then I'm wondering if any of the other speakers can talk to this question about kind of what does what does accessibility and sort of um, uh, uh, availability around supporting movements look like? Like when has that worked? Are there any examples out there? I'm sure it's not a common practice, but um, are there any examples out there that you don't need to name the foundation by name, but an example of uh, it surprised me and was incredibly helpful when a funder did X, Y, or Z, just to give people a little food for thought. Any, any thoughts on that from the other speakers? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, this is Dia. I can be real quick about this so other folks can also share. Um, what I've seen is there have been uh, a few foundations around this area who have held community discussions and conversations specific to topics that allow for intersectionality, for example, racial justice and housing, racial justice, uh, police violence and education, and the criminalization of uh, young people, school to prison pipelines, and you know, they were willing to name these by what it is and by the language in which we understand it to be how it impacts our communities. And so even holding community dialogues, allowing for the, the intersectional language to be in the space and the analysis of what kinds of funding that's needed um, is really a, a terrific and powerful first step in engaging with the community on the ground and, and being as accessible. So once you're hearing the stories, you're connecting people with where they're at, I think that allows for the relationship building um, that strengthens the longevity and sustainability of the movement. I, I also Thank like you. To oh. Just add, oh, sorry. I, just, I was also going to um, add to that. Oh, okay. Was that I think also what I've seen work is um, when <clears throat> when grant, when foundations had grant workshops <laughs> that allowed people to workshop their proposals, meet the funder. So. <laughs> Even if they don't get funded immediately, they have a relationship and they can bring immediate situations or problems. Um, and also um, being able to have materials in different languages. And <clears throat> if not grant officers that can speak different languages, then at least to be able to have materials or cultural ambassadors that can cross multiple communities because we're seeing <clears throat> the need to go beyond English language materials. And then also, one of the most awesome things I've seen a funder do in this period was to do a phone interview instead of a proposal. I've never seen that happen, but I can tell you as someone who received a, um, a foundation grant through a phone proposal, I was shocked because it meant that it like lowered my, <laughs> it lowered my, um, my development needs 
But I, I literally was like a 20 minute phone call. And then that week, the, the funds were processed and that allowed us to do um, 10 rapid response digital security trainings right away. So I, I think that when we're talking about being movement builders and not institution builders, it's about thinking about from a very critical place, how do we rework all of our ways that we interact with grantees to deal with um, events that aren't gonna be six months or three months in response need, but might even be two weeks or one week or three week in response need. Great, that's such a great example. I've, I've heard of a few funders doing that and I think it's a really great thing to explore and I, I wanna put my own encouragement out there to funders to think about how to, uh, the, the single most effective way to increase the size of your grant is to streamline your grant making process and your reporting process so that grantees have more time to do their work and aren't spending it all um, filling out your proposals and reports and financial reports, et cetera. So, uh, so I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up as a concrete example. So we're gonna do one quick um, closing uh, a poll and then I'm gonna turn it back over to Caitlin and, and she can tell you a little more about some resources that we might use to follow up with you. So last poll is what is uh, one way funders can creatively fund social movements? What did you learn on this call? One way, if you can go ahead and type it up here on the, um, the poll, that would be really great, something you learned about or that you wish we would have said, um, and we'll be taking these resources and Caitlin is gonna be putting together a blog post from NCRP, so if you can take a few minutes, and actually it's just a couple of seconds, and type out any um, thoughts you have on something your institution does or that you think others in philanthropy should do. Um, there's a few seconds left on this poll, and uh, we'd love it if you can go ahead. You can, oh, you can answer the poll either through the WebEx platform or uh, via social media, whichever um, mechanism you are following this webinar on. So uh, please take just a quick minute to share your thoughts with us. Okay, and um, I just wanna take this as a, a final opportunity again to thank um, Shalini and Marie and Dia and Kelly for all joining us on this call. And again, to Caitlin and Lorraine for putting this call together. Um, I, I uh, obviously, um, the VEACH program is a longstanding supporter of community organizing and advocacy. And we're also available as a resource to help people trying to think through these questions. And I hope that you've gotten some good creative ideas about how to uh, think differently about your funding in this moment and to really imagine that uh, there are both urgent pressing needs of every day and longer term um, uh, issues and ideas that, uh, that we need to be able to support. And so this is the best time that we could imagine to start thinking differently about our work in philanthropy and our work as funders. So thank you to everybody who filled out your thoughts on the poll and we'll definitely uh, be pulling those together and sharing them back out. And I wanna go ahead and turn it over to Caitlin to uh, close out our webinar and, and thank you all again for making time to join us on today's call. Caitlin, are you there? I think if you're talking, you're on mute. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you to Molly um, and NSG for helping us co-host this webinar and to our four speakers. I'd also like to thank the NCRP Foundation and nonprofit members on the call. Um, there are many ways to engage with NCRP, and we'd love to partner with you. Um, one way you can join us in our movement to transform philanthropy is to join as an NCRP member. Um, you can learn more at ncrp.org. Um, after today, we will have a recording and follow-up blog post available to continue this conversation. Um, so I encourage you to share that with your colleagues and your funders. So thank you again for joining us, and please do take the closing survey at the end.